It's time for This Week in WordPress, episode number 211, entitled Real World Events at Last. It was recorded on Monday the 30th of May 2022. My name's Nathan Wrigley and today I am joined by three lovely guests. First off, we've got Kathy Zant. We're also joined by Vito Peleg and Daniel Olson. As always, there's lots of WordPress things to talk about. The most important, I guess, is the fact that WordPress 6.0 has just been released. So we talk about the high level items, what's been changed, what's been included, what's been updated. We also talk about the fact that WordCamp Europe is happening very soon. In fact, it's happening during the course of this week. Three of the four panelists will be there, myself included. So we get into what it is that we get out of real world events. Do we go with an agenda or do we just wing it when we arrive? Arrive. Jeff Chandler, who started WP Tavern, is looking for a new job. And then we mention some deals in the WordPress space. And then we finally wrap up by two pieces. The first one about DocDocGo and the fact that they may, in certain situations, be selling your data to Microsoft. And finally, in California, it may be possible in the future for parents to sue social networks because of their child's addiction. It's all coming up next on This Week in WordPress. This episode of the WP Builds podcast is brought to you by GoDaddy Pro, the home of managed WordPress hosting that includes free domain, SSL, and 24 7 support. Bundle that with the hub by GoDaddy Pro to unlock more free benefits to manage multiple sites in one place, invoice clients, and get 30% off new purchases. Find out more at go.me forward slash WP builds. Hello, hello, hello. Very nice to be with you once more. This is episode number 200. And, what is that? 11. Yes. 211 of the WP builds this week in WordPress show. We've got a fine panel today. We're going to be talking basically about WordPress 6.0, I imagine, quite a lot, and also about WordCamp Europe and various other things. But let's kick it off by introducing the panel. First up, Kathy, how are you doing? Doing very well. Good to see you guys. Um, what time of the day is it where you are, Kathy? Because I always feel bad when we have North American guests on, and sometimes it's absurd o'clock. It's 8 a.m. Oh, it's, it's okay. not. It's kind of pushing hours. it. <laughs> it's not too bad. It is a holiday, though. It's uh, Memorial oh, no! Day here in the United oh, States. So, no. But I'm up at 6 a.m. every day, no matter what. I have a no. dog who's just like, time to go. Okay. My, my trainer. Okay, so that's not quite so bad then. Well, let's introduce Kathy uh, properly, shall we? Kathy is the product manager at Cadence WP. She also works with the iconic and orderable teams at Stella WP. She's worked with a number of brands in the WordPress space and often teaches security for iTheme security webinars. She's also a speaker at the upcoming Page Builder Summit and COF. I mean, who would be advertising anything about the Page Builder Summit? <laughs> Oh, look at that. Um, me, it turns out. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Kathy, before we crack into it, I, for some reason, it's passed me by the whole orderable thing that you've got going. I know it's a thing and I kind of know what it does. Can you just give us the like the elevator pitch quickly about that? Because I genuinely have, it's kind of passed me by a little bit. Yeah, it's a WooCommerce related plugin that's basically good for anybody who is doing local delivery. So basically restaurants, it's really great oh, for them. But if you're doing like high end types of things where you're not shipping and you have local clientele, like jewelry shops, things like that, it works for that as well. But yeah, it's a growing plugin here at Stellar and it's pretty exciting to work with the team. It's a Developed by the same people who do Iconic, so it's UK-based. Yeah, James, is it? James Kemp? And, James Kemp, yeah. yeah. Great yeah. guy. Yeah, really nice guy. Um, okay, that's that's fascinating. I'm guessing that it took off pretty well during the pandemic when everybody was suddenly sort of ordering food in, you know, instead of going out. So, yeah. Yeah, just in the last few months, it's really grown. Yeah, okay, nice. Well, well, well I'll have to get somebody on the podcast to chat about that. Let's, let's move on. Let's talk to Vito. Hello, Vito. Hello, hello, good to be here. Yeah, Vito, you've you've seen Vito before, he's been on the show loads, although he was on loads and then he just thought, I'm, I've had enough of that. And then he <laughs> took about two years off and then he's, then he's back. <laughs> he's, he's, he's on loads again, which is great. Vito, if you don't know, he is the, the co-founder and CEO of Atarim. Um, 
you can tell us about that in a second, which is a centralized collaboration platform for agencies. I noticed that the Bertha thing is not on there. Is that intentional or did you just decide not to mention? Um, well, Bertha is also like a project that I'm uh, involved with, but mostly Andrew is taking the reins on that front. I see. Uh, well, I'm focusing on Adarim and uh, growing that, but uh, um, we're both co-founders of Bertha as well. Just give us a quick elevator pitch for Atarim. What does it do? Who needs it? So it's a platform that helps uh, web agencies and freelancers to collaborate with their clients and their team. The idea is to systemize and automate a lot of the back and forth, a lot of the redundant communications that prolong the delivery of projects. Uh, usually a standard project takes between uh, uh, three to five days on our own, but when a client joins, it takes four to six weeks on average. So Atarim tackles this huge gap of more than 400% uh, increase to the project delivery and reducing it to something that is a lot more reasonable under 10 days or so. You're going to be tackling similar topics at WordCamp Europe, which we'll get to in just a moment. But um, yeah, anyway, thank you for coming on once again. Um, and finally, a brand new face, not to WordPress, but to this particular show. We've got Daniel Olson. Daniel, um, Daniel, I don't think is where he normally is, because if I'm right, Daniel, don't, do you... Are you in Japan normally? Have I got that totally wrong? Well, usually I'm in the greatest city in the world, no offense, but uh, <laughs> Philadelphia is my home. Um, but today I'm in Portugal. It's uh, your I company am... that's in Japan, is it? Yes. Got it. So uh, I work for Digital Cube, and Digital Cube was founded in Kobe, Japan. Uh, I call it the sister city of Philadelphia. It's kind of got the same spirit, you know, the little underdog, the, the little brother of New York, the little brother <laughs> of Tokyo. So, you know, you know, there's a lot of uh, similarities there. So we, um, it doesn't matter where you're from, Tokyo, Philadelphia, Japan, you know, it's all family. Scarborough, where are you? <laughs> right. uh, I'm going to read you, I'm going to read your bio anyway, because it's nice to get the, the full Monty. Uh, so there he is, Daniel. Daniel is the chief innovation officer at Digital Cube, a company headquartered in Japan that creates products and services for WordPress in its communities. He leads the early feature development by testing new technology with his team in Philadelphia. He enjoys collaborating with every facet of Digital Cube and its partners from the LabWorks agency team at home and abroad to helping design stickers for WordCamps. That's cool as design is very much part of our culture. He's a web developer, AWS super fan. Whoa, they're hard to find. Ooh. A Jamstack advocate, a design thinking enthusiast, and curious about AI. I'm curious about AI for all the wrong reasons. I'm curious about what is going on. But anyway, we'll, we'll leave that. But very, very nice to have you with us. Just tell us once more for those of us who are going to become quite jealous during this episode. Uh, where are you right now? We're in, I'm in, or I'm in uh, Gaia. I'm not even in Porto, but I am in, uh, I am in Portugal getting ready to go to WordCamp Europe. And I am so freaking excited. You guys yeah. have no idea how long I've yeah. been waiting for this. Yeah. Yeah. Like I want to, I want to explode. It's like, ugh, I'm ready to go. Let's go. The list of, the list of attendees has been getting longer by the day. I, uh, I've been sort of scouring that list of attendees just because of, you know, the kind of thing that I do and. And um, and every real. day it gets down. like ten longer, or you know, and, and it's it's truly massive now. Uh, Kathy was telling us, uh, Kathy, what you shared before about the numbers for WordCamp US—that's common knowledge, is it? We can say about that, can yeah. we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they're um, limiting it. <laughs> so it would appear that WordCamp Europe, which we'll talk about in a minute, you know, it's a free for all. So long as the venue is under capacity, I guess that's the limitation. So there's thousands and thousands of people going. But Kathy just told me, and I didn't know that the the limitation for WordCamp US is six fifty. Did you say attendees? Yes. Wow. And they've said it's because of the venue. Um, okay. It's going to be held in San Diego this year. But the it, curious thing is, I mean, I worked on WordCamp Phoenix, and we had about 650 attendees. WordCamp Miami is usually about 900 attendees. So WordCamp U Europe or WordCamp US is going to be even smaller than those cities. I so. know. I think WordCamp US is traditionally the, the sort of the second biggest, wasn't it? You know, it's giant, thousands of people. So what a, what a change that will be. Anyway, WordCamp Europe, we'll talk about that in a moment. Just a few little comments before we begin. First things first, if you, if you feel like it, stop what you're doing and go and share this in whichever platform you like. Twitter's a good one. You can include me at WP Builds if you like. 
Um, share the stream. It's at wpbuilds.com forward slash live. That's the easiest place to find it. Depending on how you connect, uh, if you go to that page, you'll you'll be making comments by being logged into Google because it's got YouTube comments on there. However, if you're in our Facebook group and you want to make comments, that's fine too. But there's a little bit of a, a kludge. You've got to, if you want to express who you are and give us your avatar and all of that you have to go for the ever so pithy url you have to go to chat.restream.io forward slash facebook falls off the tongue chat.restream.io forward slash fb not facebook fb i got it i got i got it wrong um go there and then you can you know you can make some comments which a couple of people have already started to do firstly cameron jones joins us all the way from australia it must be like I don't know, 11 at night. Thank you for joining us, Cameron. Very nice to have you with us. Rob Cairns is joining us as well. He's a regular, regular viewer. Maya, Maya, we're going to see you in the next few days. I'm certainly hoping so. She says, uh, what does she say? She says, hey, Rob, lovely to see you. Vito, waiting for you in Porto. Oh. It's going to be nice. Seems that everyone is traveling to Porto as chat is very quiet. Yeah, it is a little bit quieter than normal. I wonder if that's true. Let's see what happens as the show goes along. Maya, make that change. Go and share this with all the places and uh, see if we can drag some people in. Okay, what have we got for you this week? Well, <laughs> a couple of things happened this week. This one seems to be quite a big one. There's, uh, you know, there's this piece of software called WordPress, which we occasionally talk about. And every so often, they change the big number at the front. So far, it's got to six. And uh, it's a big deal. It's called Artura. I never, apart from the fact that Matt Mullenweg is really into jazz, I, I, I don't quite understand the language yet. I'm just being picky. It says that this, in, this, um, this release of WordPress uh, is, is influenced or inspired by this particular musician. And I, I don't quite understand how software is inspired by a jazz musician, but there you go, that's how it's done. And uh, and it's massive. There's an absolute boatload of new features. Let's start on this page. We're looking at wordpress.org forward slash news. Well, just go to wordpress.org and it's gonna be right near the top. What is inside? We've got a few things which really did need fixing. Raise your hand if you've tried to use Gutenberg and copy in multiple blocks or kind of delete things that's, that go between blocks. My hands are both up. Um, well, that was impossible. You basically deleted both the blocks and it didn't work. And now you can do that, which is really nice. There's a whole new set of uh, keystrokes as well. So for example, this one I've not tried out, but if you enter two square brackets, uh, you can, access, can have access to recent posts and pages, which I thought was kind of nice. Um, what else have we got? You've got custom, you can create custom buttons, it says, and add new buttons, and it will tame the, res the styles, which is kind of nice. So you don't have to build them all from scratch each time. And you can make tag clouds. Is that still a thing? Does anybody do tag clouds? I thought that was like a flash-based thing, but there you go. Uh, you can make tag clouds as well. There's a whole load of stuff done in style switching. We'll look at an article in a minute from Courtney Robertson, but that you can basically switch styles uh, through one user interface setting. So that whole thing is going to be a load easier. And we've got some new templates for, wait for it, this is quite nice, authors, date, categories, tags, and taxonomies, which is really nice. Uh, also, the whole pattern thing is taking off. Patterns now appear when you need them and in even more places, it says, like in the quick inserter or when creating a new header or footer. Um, and obviously, if you're a theme developer, the theme JSON is where you want to go and fiddle with those. There's a whole load of other stuff as well. Better view list. I couldn't quite work out what had really changed there. It looked a bit bluer. But uh, apart from that, I didn't really notice too much in terms of this. Block locking. You can now lock blocks so that other people, well, they can access them and they can edit them if they please. But at least there's a little warning saying this is locked, which they can then get rid of. Um, improved performance, they claim, although I don't quite know what that means. I didn't delve into the weeds there. And in accessibility uh, improvements as well. 50 updates specifically focused on enhancing the accessibility of the platform. I could go on, but I don't want to. I want you guys to share your experiences. Because everything seems to be happening at once, there's WordCamp Europe. WordPress 6 has come out. 
Uh, all of this is going on at the same time. WordPress was 19 the other day. I haven't really had a chance to play with WordPress 6.0, so I'm hoping some of you have. So there it is, WordPress 6. What do you think? You like it? Well, I'm to me, it... It... <laughs> yeah, it seems like a smaller update to me, actually, than 5.9 was. <laughs> it seems a little more just... I mean, I, I guess the expectation, well, 5.0, the, the, the O makes you oh, kind of want to expect this big change. But it seemed just kind of like um, a lot of under the hood changes and nothing really overtly changing in terms of my experience of using WordPress. Yeah, it's finessing a bunch of things, isn't it? Like keystrokes and under the, under the hood stuff like accessibility and speed and performance. The there, There's a couple of, like, like I said, the, the sort of ability to, refine the user interface in terms of editing text that's that is basically what i use gutenberg for is to write text and, and occasionally insert a link and very occasionally insert an image and that's kind of what, what i use it for most of the time so little things like that are an irritation and being able to to do that will save me a bit of time i'm kind of hoping that at some point wordpress is editor is as good as something like Google Docs is for editing text, you know, with its uh, ability to collaborate with other people and all that, which is coming down the wire at some point. But yeah, good point. Nothing massive. Yeah, WordPress 5.0 was a bit massive, wasn't it? <laughs> I did wonder, because Matt's got to do his thing at the at WordCamp Europe, I was thinking there's a lot going on for him to talk about. You know, it's 19, he's got a massive event going on, and WordPress 6 just came around. I, thinking oh that's a lot it sounded like somebody else was going to speak when kathy did so whoever that was go for it no kathy when you mentioned like it's not a huge update i think it's all finesse like i think it's really subtle but when you know in my experience creating products i think the best experiences that people have using your product is when you take something that you're familiar with and you make it better not give them something new it's like hey, I know you love my product, but here's something else you have to learn or here's something else you have to think about Yeah. rather than, hey, here's something that you depend on every single day, like the, that, um, the bracket you mentioned, Nathan, the double bracket command. That is like something that's kind of becoming more common in some other applications or like you, user experiences where you can search easy access to information. Yeah. It's like reducing friction. I think 6.0 is, is like a whole bundle of just reducing friction <laughs> like just making it you know a lot smoother um which the performance stuff there's probably a treasure trove of like stuff in there that you could go and look into but you're not going to like detail it all on that page because it's not that fun to talk about but what was something that people were upset about with gutenberg performance accessibility like really making the code like perfecting it um, working on it because when five rolled in, it was like a systemic change. Like everything about how we build on this open source content management system is kind of changing. We're not developing themes anymore. We're doing something different. So 5.0 was like kind of getting kicked out the door a little bit when we were already halfway out. And then 6.0 is like, I don't know, just getting comfortable outside. If you want to use an analogy. <laughs> um, Daniel, I've not had you on the show before. I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on the whole 5.0, 6.0 thing. Do you think that do you think that the the block editor should have been thrown into core, or should it have been a plugin? What what were your thoughts? I mean, now I feel it's mature, but there seemed to be so much friction at the time that 5.0 came around, and so so much yeah stress and worry about what that was going to do and how it would all work. And we got we got a couple of well three years under our belt now with all of that. But looking back, mm -hmm. what's your take on it? Should it, should it have been a plugin until maybe some point like now when we've got the full site editing capabilities and we've got this increased reliability, it's more performant and so on? Uh, great question. And if you guys want to see a train wreck, go look at my talk at WordCamp New York uh, a few years ago <laughs> where, I, where I tried to like really capture this idea, but it was not ready to talk about. Uh, but, but what kind of inspired me was changing the way that I worked was going from monolithic applications to developing uh, you know, microservices, using pieces of things, but not, not just that technique, but really using that ideology of like, how do I build my application? Well, I'm only gonna use the things that I need, why? 
I'm going to make them more, you know, easier to replace or lighter or make this application more performant. And I look at WordPress and I think, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's bundled in there and it's a very complex application and there's tons of like really talented developers working really hard to make it all work. And at the time, like I will say, I was uh, a little naive in thinking that it was that simple. Having like spent more time looking into it, I changed my tune. I think that WordPress is awesome. I think the technical like stuff they have in there, the tooling for the developers is actually really great, but it, it kind of doesn't get a lot of um, attention just because it's not something that we normally talk about. It's like, there's so many cool little NPM projects that are, that are in Word, you know, WordPress.org that like, I would love to see, you know, people talk about more that people showed me, uh, like the WP ENV uh, package, which is super cool. But looking back at like, you know, what is this big change? I think that WordPress itself should be more modular. I think that we should be able to pick and choose. And in that talk, I talked about, let's see if I remember, three versions of WordPress, basically like a build, a BYO, and it's just a config file. You can Anything that's like a dependency of what you need to do, just like any NPM package, kind of use this file and add what you need. That includes plugins, because at the same time, I was using Composer, which was like my introduction of, hey, I can use a config file to install the plugins I need and the themes and deliver it to other developers and use source control. That was really cool. But when I was thinking about WordPress, I'm like, I want WordPress like ultra light. I think I called it WordPress Alpine. <laughs> And because uh, I was like getting into Linux Alpine at the time. But that to me was like, that's what I need. I need like to, to choose what I want. But then that kind of is in WordPress. So I'm all for radical freedom. If you want that classic editor and someone's willing to support it, make it an option. If you want the Gutenberg editor, make it an option. But like for most users, they don't know that. So just give them the standard version and the developers, they'll get their own. And then there's something else and there's something other flavor. It's, I think software is like, that's the beauty of software, but WordPress hasn't fully embraced it because it's monolithic. But if you really dig into it, it's actually not, it's not that, uh, it's not that simple. Do you know what? You're the second person. I think it was David Bissett last week was talking about a WordPress light, um, about the option to have a, a kind of like slim down version with, I don't really even know what, what, what it meant. Cause I, I didn't really get into the weeds of it all, but yeah, it's mm -hmm. a curious idea. Um, yeah, a, a light version and Vito finally WordPress 6.0, you know, obviously all of your clients are using WordPress. Actually, is that true? Is that a, a WordPress specific thing or could you use it for any kind of business? As of uh, two weeks ago, we're now available for every website in the world. Uh, so that was really exciting. Thank you. And it was we like I knew that I should ask that question. <laughs> um, so, so, but most are still using WordPress. Yeah, yeah. And what do you make of this 6.0? Does it cause, like, you know, for your customers who are obviously building sites for thousands and thousands of people, presumably this is a bit of a pain point. Oh, here we go. I saw a lot of comments this week, and I used to do this, and I don't anymore. I used to wait a couple of days or until 6.1 or 6. Point, you know, whatever came out. I've kind of given up on that now and just hit the button and pray. Um, which, which hasn't bitten me in the back yet. Rob says he's updated 320. I'll put that comment up. He says he's put 325 sites up to WordPress 6.0 with no, awesome. no, no major issues. 325 <laughs> minor issues, probably, Rob. <laughs> um, but big, big moment. You know, if, it, if like Rob, you've got hundreds of sites, your customers presumably have Vito. Like that's a that's a big moment. Yes, and well, we pr try to prepare for this as well. You know, like using. Uh, uh, using 6.0 for a few weeks before it was released and just trying mm. to figure out if there's anything that we can do or that we need to adapt to. Uh, but I think that like Kathy was saying, and I agree with Daniel as well, it's like, uh, it, it's, it doesn't feel like a point .0 release because as soon as we heard there is like a point .0 release, it's like, okay, let's clear some time in the dev queue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's make sure that everything is working, you know, but yeah. then it's just, um, it is a point something you know like a it's a point 10 uh 5.10 mm -hmm. um that's that would make more sense for for just the kind of like this definition of it but i also um 
I also know, I don't know if this is really the driver, but I also know when it comes to the naming conventions of these things, a lot of times it's driven by other, other um, reasonings, like WordCamp Europe is here, yeah. uh, and it's the first camp after a few years uh, that is kind of physical, so it would be great to announce a new version that is point something. So we actually bundled up a few things ourselves, and we're releasing 3.0 at WordCamp. So um, we were kind of like taking that same opportunity for that um, for for that announcement, you know, at at some kind of an event like this. Uh, so I think that that might have something to do with it because I don't feel that it is such a substantial upgrade. It is a bunch of uh, small, um, even bug fixes or like like. You know, when you build a roadmap, you have the rocks. You know, if you put like a jar, you, you have the rocks and then you have the pebbles, then you have the sand and the water. So these are <laughs> just, uh, yeah. um, just a few pebbles in there and some water. You know, it's not, not no rocks that I'm feeling in this release. You know, well, right? it looks like um, it looks like widespread opinion is that it hasn't broken a lot. I, I certainly didn't hear the clamor of this has broken anywhere, you know, and I sort of frequent all of those places. Um Thank you for some comments coming in. Uh, hello, Elliot. Nice to have you with us. One concern that uh, Peter, hello, Peter. Nice to have you as well. One concern that he has uh, with 5.96.0 is making the block theme and beta editor the default for new installs. It's okay for devs, but maybe not so great for new users. Yeah, I got to say that took me a bit by surprise when I first saw that. The fact that all of that theme stuff has gone and we're, you know, if you've got two point, uh, sorry, if you've got, 2022 installed as the default if you've you know just doing a vanilla install then all of that has changed it's like what wait what's going on and if you're slightly familiar with wordpress enough to do just some damage that kind of stuff did feel a little bit like should we toggle this on by choice speaking of which um Daniel, Daniel Mace says an option to install for the block editor or classic would be ace you can if you like, Daniel, I'm sure you know this, there is um, there is a fork of WordPress called Classic Press, uh, but the, it, there's no toggle. It's just the, the tiny mice editor. There's no Gutenberg in sight, as far as I'm aware, so you can go that route uh, if you like. Okay, let's just show another article. I just want to give props to Courtney. Lots of people, as you'd imagine, uh, spent a long time writing up what uh, what was good about WordPress 6.0, and I just stumbled across this up, up on this one, and I thought it was quite a nice one, so I'm going to share it. It's GoDaddy.com forward slash garage forward slash What's New in WordPress 6.0, all of it separated with hyphens, as you imagine. And she does a really nice long deep dive. And so, for example, the stuff that we mentioned earlier, you can see the style switcher here. Uh, in operation, you know, various different things. You can just click a button and the whole site changes, which is really nice. Uh, we mentioned the templates. We mentioned... Really nice, but how useful. Like, how many yeah. times do you the style of your website, you know? Well, I, I was thinking, you know, I would I would imagine most people will settle on something. But I, is it is it useful for that playing period when you're just sort of trying to figure out where you want to land? And you, you know, you've got the red variant, and you've got the blue variant, and you maybe show it to the clients, and oh look, we can go for this one if you like, or this one. Maybe. But I agree, I think you'd be it, maybe not all that useful once it's uh, once the site is shipped. What about uh, seasonals? Yeah, what the Christmas theme? Yeah, yeah, invoke snow button, ching, and yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> go to uh, go to um, like Target's website uh, before uh, right now, probably it probably looks all summer themed, right? Right, like little little right. touches of it. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess it's nice to have it there rather than having to switch out a theme or a child theme or something like that. You've now got an option to just hit yeah. a button, and you know that kind of stuff can be changed. It, cool. I don't imagine that I'll use it a great deal, but there it is. Okay. Um, we mentioned about the fact that the the inspector, what is it even called, the inserter, and the list view has been tightened up a bit. I'm having more luck, I've got to say, recently dragging and dropping things. Before, it was like, throw a coin in the air and see if it ends up where it was supposed to be or if it just ends up at the top of the page. But now I'm kind of getting there more or less 100% of the time, so that's quite, kind of quite nice. So anyway, go and check out Courtney's article. She's done a great job in uh, writing up all of the bits and pieces. Right, we've been delaying the subject. 
we're not going to delay anymore. We're going to talk endlessly about WordCamp Europe um, because it's happening. It's the biggest thing in WordPress since, well, since like 2020, the beginning of 2020. Previous numbers, we had like 3,000 people um, at the one in Berlin. I'm very much imagining that we're going to have sort of similar numbers. We talked about that a little bit. I'm, I've decided to go. Vito, you're going. Daniel, like he's in Porto, but he's not going to bother. Uh, he's just going to stand outside. And, yeah, that's it. he's off. Look, he's, he's going. Can you show us? Oh, look at that. Look at that. Hang on, hang on. Let's make it big. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> oh. Well, you've gone deaf. You've gone, um, I can't hear you. Sound, yeah. There you go. I muted myself. Of course. That's okay. So I get full signal right here, but like right here, it goes. If I drop out, I'll just don't back on. Look but, at that. So here's a little view. Oh. So Porto is awesome. So Porto is that way. Right now, I'm actually in Gaia, where I heard that they filmed Fast and the Furious. Any fans out there? Um, but yeah, the city's so beautiful. I feel like I'm a CNN reporter right now. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Live on the scene. What, no, it's, the, the, it's the crucial so thing I want to know is in degrees centigrade, how hot is it? Don't tell me Fahrenheit. That's a meaningless number. <laughs> uh, I have no idea. But right now, it's cool. Like the, the air on my skin feels great. I could stay out here all day. But earlier, it was a little hot. Uh, it got like kind of muggy. I felt like I was being steamed. Uh, I guess because it, it rained earlier, but um, the weather has been wonderful. It's been like the same temperature as your skin. Like that, that's like the perfect way. I don't know what like you guys like, but I will take that any day of the week. Perfect it's happening. It, so it kicks off on, uh, I want to get this right. It's the second to the 4th of June. If I got those numbers right, that's right, isn't it? Um, it's at a place called the Superboc Arena. It's in Porto, Portugal. Lots and lots of people. There's tons and tons of uh, fabulous talks. You can see the schedule page. I, I would imagine, but I'm not 100% certain, that it'll all be um, available on WordPress TV after the fact. Whether or not it's going to be streamed live, I don't know. Um, the venue itself is huge. It's like, imagine taking a football and I, I say foot, soccer ball, and just like slicing the top third off and then making that as a building. That's what it's like. It's like just this perfect dome. Um, and I'm <laughs> so beautiful weather, glorious, glorious stuff. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be for the whole time, more or less, inside a room with no window. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> interviewing people uh but that'll be you know that'll be fun i'm going to enjoy it and make the most of the evenings so Vito, why do you go to stuff like this like the last time that i was with you in berlin you were launching what was then wp feedback it was it was definitely in the beginning phase and you were on a mission to make it known which i think it's fair to say you succeeded at what's the what's the angle this time you're going with a team you're taking just you are you going with like loads of pamphlets? Is it schmoozing? Is it speaking? I know the answer, but tell us what's going on. All of the above. Yeah. So uh, basically this year, so when, when we went back then, um, I kind of, that was my first WordCamp Europe experience. And we, we were just launching the company and I kind of made um, a point for myself in terms of speaking in public that um, the holy grail is to get to speak at WordCamp Europe. And now it's happening. So I'm really, really excited about this. Um, I've, I've done a bunch of uh, WordCamps throughout or, you know, the online ones and even back in 2019 where it was still possible, uh, just the smaller ones and kind of like building it up to this. And it only took about 250 other talks to get to this. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm, ex I'm really excited that this is finally happening. And we're also sponsoring this time. And uh, we have a booth, um, which we never had a real booth at a camp before. We were sponsoring, but usually it was really small. Uh, but now we have like a proper booth. And uh, so there's some exciting things that are happening in there. I'm going, it's going to be myself and Alex from uh, my team. You know, Alex, you yeah. met Alex in London as well, right? Yep. Uh, so we're both coming uh, uh, together. And of course, there's loads of friends. And, and now it's more about... Um, 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 reigniting the relationships that we, we were kind of sustaining for the past three years 
um, with with existing partners. With uh, you know, I haven't seen Kathy since WorthCamp uh, US, uh, so I, I wish you were coming as well. Um, and, I wish uh, I was too. <laughs> and so, so that's really is like I, I feel that it's gonna be more of a friends party than how than how it was back then, where I was I needed to kind of like. Um, get myself known now i feel like i'm i'm kind of uh, uh there so so um it's just gonna be more about meeting the people that we're hanging out with uh oh i'm gonna see picture there as well I see oh. that. Jan. and um yeah so there's there's partnerships the sponsorships there's um uh, speaking uh, meeting our users and mostly just hanging out having fun you know just partying with our WordPress people. Can, can I drill down into that a little bit more? Firstly, how's the talk gone going? How are you doing with that? Is it all, you know, does it keep you awake at night, that kind of stuff? Or are you pretty sanguine about it? Yeah, I'm cool with this. Um, mm. we, I had to deliver the session like a couple of weeks ago already. Uh, so that's already done with. And I might kind of rehearse it a few times, but I talk about this stuff all day long anyway, yeah. every day for a few years. So uh, it's just going to be... Uh, the the slides are more of a guide to uh, to to just kind of like uh, talking about it freely. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And also from a business point of view, obviously you go in there and you you, you know you, you want to make it worthwhile. What are the sort of the metrics that you've got in the back of your mind? Whether you've written them down on a spreadsheet or whether it's just okay. Anecdotally, I, I would like to walk away from that event with this, this, this thing that's happened. What What are those specifically? So what I learned at first, I was uh, you know in the first few events, I was kind of thinking of like uh, how many users can I get from this event, you know? Uh, but now it kind of shifted. We're not. I'm not looking to get specific users there. It's more about meeting our existing users. Nice. Um, but um, but but um, when it comes to let's say acquisition or business, it's more about partnerships. Uh, that's where you can really do those things uh, uh, in a in a really magical way. Uh, you know, because you can find users uh, everywhere, but to have a sit down with uh, the folks from Stellar or the folks from uh, this hosting company or that thing, you know, that that really doesn't happen as often as um, as, uh, as as it it can at these events so I'm hyper focused on uh, on uh, partnerships um, as well as meeting our existing users mostly mm -hmm. and if someone yeah, wants a demo we're gonna be there as well you know so that's nice got that's yourself a little about. booth there Stella's gonna be there what's do, do you know I know Kathy sorry yeah. that you would like to go but it's not happening this time do you know do you know what the, the team are doing this time around is it a little bit like what Vito was saying, you're just sort of trying to reestablish connections with people that you've already been as customers, or you're on the you're on a mission to subscribe some more people to your platform. Yeah, I, I mean, of course, Stellar is a part of of Liquid Web, so um, there's hosting. There's a number of different services beyond just plugins that Stellar can help people kind of get together. And for for us, it's about relationship. I mean, all businesses, relationships, you have relationships with your customers, um, being able to see what other people are doing. I mean, Cadence became a part of Stellar because yeah. of relationships that occurred at WordCamp US a couple of years ago. So those types of relationships where, you know, organizations can work together for the greater good of everyone who uses WordPress and kind of elevate each other. Um, that's what it's all about. So we do have a team of people who are going to be at WordCamp Europe and they all have my, you know, meeting link. <laughs> so I'm like, if you know of anybody that needs to talk about Cadence or Audible or Iconic, hook me up. I'll be there virtually. I'm really hoping some of the sessions can be live. I don't know if, are they live streaming? WordCamp yeah, I don't know cause... either, to be honest. I hope so. Yeah. Um, I kind of hope that I... that's a feature of it all going forwards, to be honest, because the the, the sort of the difficulty in doing that is so modest. I can't see, really see. You need a camera at the back of the room, which is already there to film it anyway, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I'm kind of sad. I'm going to miss Vito's talk. <laughs> I would really like to see it. So I, I, if I have to wait a couple of months before it to get on WordCamp TV or, or WordPress TV. I heard that it might be going live. It might be yeah. uh, but, uh But then I looked for it because some people asked me for it and I couldn't find any details about it. So I'm, I'm no. not sure. 
Yeah, Vito, I'll, uh, if you give me your phone, I'll live stream it from your own phone. There you go. There's the, <laughs> that's the cottage I'll, industry way of doing you. it. That's I love right. it. We'll make it real simple <laughs> and easy. So. Yeah. You know, that's it. That's literally all you need, right? I mean, yeah. the quality yeah. doesn't have to be super. I guess there are things like the closed captioning, which might be sure. something which... I mean, you kind of have to well, like... The acceptable, what is a um, Maya, uh, most advanced yet acceptable. It's like, I'll live stream you, but like, we just decided that. So like, <laughs> but maybe we could, I don't know. Does Twitter support that? Or could you find a service that does? Like, or you could just video the screen where everything is on with all the closed captions, because it's got the video of the yeah. speaker, hasn't it? And, right. and all the other bits. So you could actually just video that and you'd get the whole thing all at once. There you go. There's or the, we'll there's the... And I'll live type it for you. <laughs> That's it. Like... Oh, oh, brave. Oh, oh, Vito, full typo, so. you've got to speak Sorry. really fast and see if you can, uh, <laughs> see if you can, see if you can, Daniel, what about you then? I know that obviously you're going, we were being silly earlier. Um, similar idea are you going with a particular agenda in mind or is it just a social what's the, what's the big plan uh i mean rule rule for us is uh we don't do too much like sales at word camps uh for us it's really just we want to connect with the community um like we've been a part of the community for so long uh, I, I kind of hovered around wordpress for most of my career uh, but some of the people i work with literally you know translated wordpress into japanese and found some of the first word camps in japan and like created these, you know, it's like Japan is the second or third largest install base of, of uh, WordPress. So you know, for us, it really is connecting with like. Wait, people wait, who... hang on. Say what? Say that again. Japan is what? The second largest user installation base of WordPress. I had um, no idea. It was second for a while. I, you could check the stats. I think it's German now. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and really, uh, the whole polygot like thing was um, what was the first language translated from WordPress, you know, English? I, I believe it was Japanese, and I, right. I believe it was my team. And from what I've been told, you know, I wasn't there. So, but you know, the the history of WordPress in Japan it's been fascinating to me. It's all about community, super super strong community, and kind of being introduced to that like there it changed my perspective on what like we're actually doing and the mm -hmm. whole like open source movement, uh, you know, using partnerships as a way to develop new capabilities. Uh, you know, you know, it's just like, you gotta be there. You gotta be there to like, you know, just uh, ricochet ideas off, you know, your collaborators and maybe get inspired by something new or hear something interesting or you never know what you're going to find at WordCamp. Yeah. Like I literally walked into, the first ever time I went to WordCamp, I walked up to a booth and I was like, this looks pretty cool. Hey, do you want to go grab a beer? And now that guy is uh, Hiromichi Koga, our CEO. So going to WordCamp <laughs> can literally change your life. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great story. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Do you speak Japanese? I'm studying. and You're studying, yeah. I got... Uh, called on the spot the other day because I've been saying thank you in Japanese like a lot because in Portuguese it sounds very similar to Japanese to me especially when you're studying Japanese every day so obrigado or obrigado is thank you in Portuguese and arigato gozaimasu is uh, okay. thank you in Japanese so arigato is throwing me off everywhere well <laughs> that's all I'm hearing We've got the um, the live streaming, Peter says, would be great because, you know, there's a lot of people who would like to view this content and don't have the time or the budget. So I'm, I'm going to put Daniel in charge of that. Uh, I don't know by whose authority, but Daniel is in charge of live streaming. And on one hand, he's going to translate into Japanese and doing the caption. And then the other hand, he's going to be doing the English captions. So, you yeah, know, nothing, keyboards, <laughs> nothing like too... Sticks. Nothing, <laughs> Nothing too difficult. Um, there's Peacher. Peacher's dropped into the chat as well, and she's saying that she's going as well. Uh, Peacher, in answer to your question, when am I going? I'm going tomorrow. Um, I'm going to arrive there at about five in the afternoon, I believe it is, something like that. Um, and then, uh, who knows, probably 
find people to uh, to go and have a drink with or something like that. Uh, da, 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 da. Right. Anyway, the reason that, that was all mentioned was because on the Post Status website, we have this lovely piece. It looks like it's from the, um, the WordCamp Europe website, but it's not. And it's all about making the most of WordCamp. And so we've had three different opinions as to what they're doing there. Oh, I should probably say what I'm doing. I think I already did. I'm going there to interview people uh, for the WP Tavern podcast. So I'm really looking forward to that. So here we go. A couple of things that you might like to take into account. Firstly, I, I do think if you are going, it is quite good to have a bit of a plan of action. It's all very nice to uh, to just sort of rock up and look at the schedule as you walk through the Super Bock Arena's door. But, you know, have a have a bit of a plan. I can't see that backfiring too much. Uh, and so here we go. Networking is obviously a good one. There's going to be a big hallway track, although I, I don't know quite how they're going to call it that this year because it's all outside. It'll have to be the outside track or something like that. This is why when you said it was raining, Daniel, I was a bit dismayed because if you're not if you're not watching a talk, you're basically outside. And I was assuming it never rained in in Porto at this time of year. But uh, there we go. Uh, pay attention to the WWCEU social media. This is something that you know keep, keep, keeps you on top of what's going on and and when it's happening. Uh, make a sort of to do list of things that you're um, that you're that have occurred to you during the whole thing, and then follow it up when you return home. Uh, engage with the sponsors. I'm sure that Vito and Kathy can can. I, okay, let's have this conversation. How how different are you? How different is the experience with the online stuff in terms of sponsors and the the in person stuff? I'm guessing that the engagement is like completely radically different. I'm guessing that the online sponsorship of things like the Page Builder Summit is just a different beast than the one where you go and do live and. Vito, you were mentioning that you're getting a booth. I presume you're expecting to be fairly busy there. Um, I think so. Mm. I hope so. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Let's see how it goes. You never know, to be honest, with these events, how it's going to go. Um, uh, but um, but I have a feeling that it's going to be rather busy. Um, uh, again, from, from our point of view, it wasn't so much about, uh, um, about kind of like getting leads or, or users from there. Even though it would be nice, of course, you know, it's not, I'm not gonna object to to new uh, new users coming on board, uh, but it's more about like um, making the appearance, giving out of these like our notebooks over there, uh, and um, and just hanging out. Really, that was the thing. I, I I felt that it's been a few years since I could have uh, you know, apart from the acti- the other activities that we're doing with the community. I didn't have much opportunity to give back, if you will. So the sponsorship initially was done just on that notion. Uh, and then when we realized that there's potential for other things, then we kind of like started thinking about this from another point. But you know me, Nathan, I'm not going to be confined to a booth. I'm going to be <laughs> everywhere anyway. <laughs> Aren't there guidelines about if you're in the sponsors area, you've got to, you've got to stay within like a certain... Well, part of the, the booth can stay, but I'm going. Oh, see, yeah, yeah, the, the, leave the booth behind. It oh, feels okay. like an alarm when you leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, you, got, you have to wear some sort of collar yeah, like, around uh, your ankle. Collar, yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> WP Hobb is asking who the sponsors are. Well, it's broad and rich. There's absolutely loads of them. If you go to the sponsor page, it's europe.wordcamp.org forward slash 2022 forward slash sponsors. So many. I mean, there's absolutely loads. And they... They're the big companies that you've heard of. So, for example, Google and Jetpack and and what have you. And then you've got all the sponsors, Elementor, Molly, Yoast. You just mentioned Bertha, GoDaddy Pro, all of these companies. And they're they're sponsoring at different levels. So there's the big ones. They're called the super admin sponsors. And then you get admin sponsors. I don't know what you get that's different. Maybe you just get more space or more people there. Editor sponsors, after party sponsors who will be in charge of the after party, which I only found out today finishes at five in the morning what's that about well, no. five I, I i can barely get to like 11 at night honestly i'm just gonna sit in the corner i think and uh, talk rubbish <laughs> uh author sponsors then you've got small business sponsors charging station sponsors and then you've got institutional support which is the city uh, of porto so th- there's loads and loads of sponsors and i i have no no insight really into what what they get for their money, but I'm presuming the higher up on that page you are, the more you're paid and the more you're kind of expecting uh, to get out of it, I would have thought. I don't really know. Um, Courtney 
is in the airport. No, no. We were just talking about you, Courtney, on your wonderful article, and there you are. Are you at the Porto Airport now, Courtney? If so, good luck finding your hotel. I hope that all is easy, and I will be there at some point tomorrow. Safe travel. Oh, airport US side, maybe, not airport Porto side. Who knows? Okay, let's go to the next piece. All right, bit of WP drama, probably. A little while ago, there was quite a lot of annoyance on the dot-com side of things because they up, they upended their pricing model. Now, this is in answer to that. If we read this article, we find out that the people in charge of releasing the pricing and m- making the announcement, they feel that they misstepped. And I, I think he even said something along the lines of, what did he say? Martin who is, sorry, Dave Martin, who is the CEO, WordPress.com CEO. Uh, I can't find the quote now, but he basically said, look, we we screwed up. Uh, sorry about that. Um, because they reduced what you could get and so on and so forth. So they've now come out with this new tier. It's the $5 tier. It's called a starter plan. And that's pretty aggressive pricing. Let me just run through what you get. Uh, you get a custom domain name. You get the ability to um, take payments. You get, well, I think that's six gigabytes of storage. So, I mean, it's enough for most websites with lots and lots of images. And what have you What have you ordered thought? Google Analytics has been thrown in, um, but you're not, you've not got access to the WordPress repo. You've not got access to premium support or premium themes, and you can't sell things with WooCommerce. Although it does say you can collect payments. I guess that's subscriptions and things like that. But $5 a month, that's that's pretty aggressive, I would have thought. I don't know what you guys think about this, eating eating the lunch of other companies, but that seems like a pretty good deal. You know, I just had an intuitive hit that I feel like this is kind of, this is a plan that's perfect for, well, First of all, it's going to challenge some of the businesses that do budget hosting, but I really feel with that, that collecting payments is going to be a good alternative to sort of the growth we've seen in Substack, where we've got a lot of people who are writing and, you know, there's, there seems to be a very high um, premium placed on free speech over there, but Substack takes a percentage of everything that, you know, that's collected in terms of payments over there. And so I've been watching for a solution that would be on WordPress where people could be paid for their writing where there isn't that percentage. So if you do grow, you get to keep more of your money. And I think something right. like this would be a great opportunity for someone who is looking at maybe a sub stack, um, going to wordpress.com, being able to be paid for their writing, for their journalism, and um, have rock solid hosting over there as well. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't really made the connection with that. But Substack apparently is going absolutely bananas, isn't it? There's people signing up there left, right and centre. It's really taken off. And this would work for that, wouldn't it? Like you said, you get to keep your own revenue. I, I see on this WP Tavern article anything about what the what the fees are for those payments taken. I'm, I'm presuming it's a direct connection with something like Stripe or something like that. I don't know, in which case I'm guessing it'll be the normal fees, whether or not WordPress.com take any of that isn't mentioned. But but Cameron uh, in the comments points out the sort of some somewhat massive Achilles heel to this. And I, I kind of feel that the days of this, I, I thought the days of this was gone, but here we go. You, with the starter plan, you you still you still have ads. Um, there will be ads put into your website. Now let me see if I can find the find the quote about this. Da, da, da. The new to starter plan involves some customers. No, I can't find it. But it, it's definitely there. So how frequent those ads are, how much space they consume, I have no idea. But you just have to know that you don't get a complete free ride. You are not on a vanilla WordPress site. You know, you may have secured your own domain, but there will be some ads in there. If I can find it, that would be good, but I can't now at this point. But that that just seems like a little bit kind of strange in this day and age. I, I've kind of got to the point where if I'm paying any amount of money to anything, you know, I'm thinking of Netflix, for example, I am fully not expecting to see ads on Netflix if I'm paying for it. And in the same with this. I know it's cheap. It's $5 a month. It's not a lot a year, but still... But maybe that's the way they can justify it. 
I think that, or I, I know that the the ads uh, as a revenue stream for WordPress.com has been something that uh, helped them grow substantially over the years. Uh, so, um, but I do agree with you, Nathan, that today, if you're if you're charging for something, then um, um, I think that's like a, a bit even pushy. Uh, I, I think there's other places, ways to do it. I, I think that you were talking about Stripe and stuff like this. There might be even another two percent or or something like this that is being taken uh, taken beyond the the Stripe uh, uh, percentage as well. This is something that does happen in other um, in other software um, at at the lower tiers or the free tiers, um, even inside our own ecosystem. That you get something has been taken like one to two more percent are being taken um, uh, from every transaction. And I think that can supplement the ads just as is, you know, because they're both reliant on traffic. If you have no traffic to that website, then ads don't matter. Right. And if you have traffic to the website, then you can have sales where you can take percentage from. So I think that that could really supplement that. But ads are really, it's kind of weird to see nowadays in a website, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, especially, you know, I mean, if you put the ads there, then well, if you put the ads, yeah, that's right. If you're putting the ads there in order to, to monetize it, but if you're not putting the ads, I mean, obviously, you know, with platforms like Google and so on, you don't really get to know what the ads are that are going to be on there, but you chose that block, that's where the ads are going to go, and so on. It just kind of said, I found the bit, it says the new starter plan solves some of these customers' issues, but it's still partially subsidized by advertising. Customers on this plan and the free plan will have ads displayed on their site, but we don't get any insight into how much or how often and how big. Um, this is different than the legacy personal plan which was full $4 a month, but is was ad-free. You used to get a custom domain and so on and so forth with that as well. So that's quite interesting. It doesn't, however, include, the, the legacy one doesn't, however, include Google Analytics. One thing worth noting is if you were on a plan, you are still on that plan unless you unless you cease to go for that subscription you will be kept on it and you know you'll be grandfathered in so if you're if you're on what you consider a better deal from a couple of years ago you can just keep going with that but uh, yeah cheap as chips any thoughts on that daniel uh i'm gonna use another analogy but um the way i think about websites is like this is your real estate on the internet like it's your little slice of the moon or wherever slice of real estate that you want and you can do kind of whatever you want with it um, as long as you're you know playing by the rules and to me that's like building you know buying a house buying the land and then like the builder coming and putting their sign on like the side of your house right which yeah. actually happens <laughs> all the time uh, every time yes. yeah 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 but like i mean i think that you kind of you they'll find customers who are completely fine with that have no problem at all I would never be okay with like, you know, ads in my site if I was paying for a service. You know, I'm paying you a premium for something. I'm paying you to not inject ads into my website. Uh, like give me the option for that at the minimum once I start paying you. Mm -hmm. uh, for free, you're like go ham, advertise whatever you want. I'm not paying you anything. So I feel like that's kind of the line and you know, they'll, they'll find customers who are completely fine with that. And, most people are. I think you know people just want to share their content or make uh, revenue from it and do it very easily and passively. Just like, hey, you know what I'm going to do this weekend? I'm going to put all that stuff I wrote on a, a site, and you know maybe three months from now it's getting some pretty good traffic, and I can like buy a coffee with it or I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. like you kind of yeah, you good you should be in control of that. So it could be a good thing, a bad thing. It really depends on who you know you're talking about. I yeah, mean, it's not for us, you know. Like we're not right. Gonna plan for five bucks a month you know it's not really yeah yeah good point yeah. okay um so there we go that's the news coming out of wordpress.com that felt like the wp drama story uh, of the week let's move on to the next one this is nice uh we've been talking about wordcamp europe this is uh, a story again on the tavern this is sarah gooding um who, who is sort of writing all of the well the majority of the piece at the moment because we're in that transition phase they've they've put out um, a job application because Justin Tadlock has gone elsewhere and and Sarah's taking taking the reins, shall we say. I did see there was a couple of posts from uh, guest authors, but she's doing a, a great job keeping the fires burning. And this is just to say that the community team is removing a lot of the red tape around regional WordCamp 
applications. Now, me not being somebody that's ever tried to organize a WordCamp uh, application, I really fully understand it. But my understanding is that in the past, if you wanted to have a regional one, say, I don't know, um, Northern Europe or Eastern Europe or whatever it may be, you had to go through quite a lot of hoops in terms of there had to be already established ones in various cities around the, the locale. And then you had to fill out some paperwork, which was quite onerous. And, and apparently that is largely moving away. The bottom line is it's going to be easier to put on regional word camps. And I, I kind of feel that at the moment, it was a big decision for me just from the COVID thing. Only that decision, that, that was a big hurdle for me. And the idea of going fairly far away on a plane was, you know, I had to really toss that around in my head. And if there's more local ones, it's it's quite likely that I'll, I'll probably favour those um, because it's just much more easy. There's less friction. I'm in the same jurisdiction. I know what I'm getting into in terms of medicine and all of that kind of stuff. But there we go. So that's going to be coming down. I don't know exactly whether that's happening or if it's just been mooted to happen. But yeah. Uh, making word camps, bigger word camps, regional word camps, uh, easier to put on. Like we should probably get Dan maybe on. He knows all about this. Um, but yeah, okay. Anything about that or should we move on? Okay. Uh, any? Did you guys have any plans to go to word camp Asia back when it was a thing? Yeah. Oh, well, what, before it got cancelled? Yeah. Yeah, no, I I had no plan. I know Peacher, who's in the chat, she um, she was like good to go. You know, she got the ticket. I, she may even have been speaking, and it, it it all it all crumbled very quickly, didn't it? And do you remember the story at the time? It all happened so quickly, and it was just pulled from WordCamp Central, and the message went out. Mm -hmm. So, no, but I I wouldn't rule it out. But the, it's the COVID thing for me. I've got to weigh all that up because of the family and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think um, had, had has anyone been to WordCamp? Well, there's only one WordCamp uh, North. Sorry, you broke broke up when you said that word. Oh, camp sorry. Uh, WordCamp Nordic. No. No. So I, I was really lucky to go to that one. It was uh, in Finland, Helsinki. And uh, just a shout out to anyone out there who has the ability to make that happen again. Uh, I would love a WordCamp. Uh, Nordic <laughs> sometime in the future. Yeah. It was it was yeah. one of the coolest. I that whole region and yeah, it was so cool. Really? I mean literally yeah. cool. Was it like minus 40 degrees or so? <laughs> yeah, it was so cold. <laughs> Went swimming in the Baltic, like grabbed a little iceberg and floated it for a little bit. Seriously. <laughs> one extreme to the other. Porto yeah. to Word Camp Nordic. Anyway, if you're curious about putting these kind of events on, hopefully um things will be a touch easier for you going forward. Forwards. Okay, so let's move to a, a, a and, and I'm raising this one because I would like um, I would like to, to to just sort of raise awareness. Jeff Chandler, who many many years ago started WP Tavern and basically kept it going for years and years and years, he stepped away from that. Justin Tadlock came in, wrote. Uh, a different style of article. And then a, a little while ago, I'm going to say about 18 months, but I could have got the timeline wrong there. Jeff relaunched his uh, WordPress, his WordPress business, I guess is maybe the right way to put it, with a site called WP Mainline. Um, he's been doing it periodically since then. And he's written this update this week. It was on the 26th of May. And he's basically saying that he he hasn't really been able to keep the momentum going for a whole variety of different reasons that you can read on the blog post. And so what he's going to do is he's going to turn WP Mainline into more of a side gig and less of the main thing that I think when he launched it, he was hoping it would turn into. And he has put himself up for hire. And, and you know, Jeff has been around the longest time writing about all the things, talking to all the people, you know, more or less single-handedly did WP Tavern for years and years and years and probably knows almost everybody. Uh, he He's basically saying he's he's keen to, to be a part of a team. He wants to take on some, to be an employee and he's sort of laid out what his job description is. It's a curious way of, uh, way of doing things and I don't think many people could get away with this, but I feel that he's one of them because his name is just so well known. So really, this is just me. Um, Jeff, 
good luck. Hope that you know that this piece gets out there and that people start ringing your phone and contacting you with all the methods that you outline on there. Because uh, yeah, I think you've you've certainly put in many many years worth of work and uh, good luck. Anybody want to chip in there? I don't think it's going to be very hard to find uh, another place as a as a content writer for uh, WordPress. Uh, you can apply for the tavern. They're, all, they're looking for a writer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe that's good timing. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what the. I don't know how it's all. So, like it's very hard to find uh, uh, dedicated and quality writers in the WordPress space. So um, I'm sure it's going to be. Uh, it's not. It's not going to wait for long. That's for sure. Um, let's have a look. There's a few little comments in here. Da, 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 da. This will help Washington DC having a word camp. This is Courtney again, um, getting accommodation within city limits was extremely prohibited. I'm not, I can't quite place where that was in the conversation that we were talking and yeah, Peacher talking about word camp Asia. She was a speaker and it was all canceled a few days before that was in that time. Wasn't it Peacher where nobody really had any insight into whether COVID was going to be a thing with the benefit of hindsight. That was probably the best decision they could have made, but at the time it did feel as if it was all a bit rushed, didn't it? And uh, But, you know, history shows um, that it was probably the right thing to do. Okay, quick plug, Page Builder Summit. If you're into summits and page builders and WordPress, well, we've got a summit. It's called the Page Builder Summit. It's on the 20th to the 24th of June. You can go and join the wait list. I don't need to say anything more. We'd love to see you there. And somebody... Somebody right here, Kathy. Kathy. Kathy's Kathy's going to be presenting there. So, uh, and um, yeah, very, very, very grateful for you doing that. Pagebuildersummit.com. Go and sign up to the list. All right, let's throw some deals at you. You're doing this one. I'm saying you, and you mentioned earlier that it was Andrew that's largely talking about both of these days, but you've got one now. This is bound to WordCamp Europe, right? 50% yes. off or something? So, uh, yeah, 50% off um, during WordCamp Europe. Andrew is going to be there as well as Stephanie Hudson that has joined us on the team as well. And, um, yeah, and this is kind of like our way of uh, giving back uh, uh, to the community while also riding the wave, uh, at, you know, at the same time. So this is 50%. Have I got that right? 50% off? Yep. Exactly. 50% off during the time it's that the biggest camp. discount we've ever did on uh, on Bertha and it's been uh, it's been growing steadily since we started um, about six months ago or so uh, but uh, because be Andrew and I actually met at, uh, at a conference and we became really good friends at WordCamp uh, Europe uh, back in Berlin so we kind of thought that would be a nice uh, thing to do here yeah, that is cool. And it looks like there's a couple, uh, eight. I don't know if this is still correct at the time of uh, reading this out, but there's still some lifetime deals around eight, apparently. So there you go. A little less now, yeah. A little less. Okay, yeah. Uh, so maybe seven or six or something like that. Anyway, <laughs> that's there. The other thing that I wanted to mention is if you're a user, if you like sort of Photoshop, scouring the internet for cheap Photoshop alternatives because you don't like to pay for the Adobe fees, I can highly recommend the Affinity products. I really like them. And they are cheap as chips anyway. I can't remember what the numbers are, but you know, you pay once and it's yours. I think you probably have to pay if it goes through some sort of major point release or something like that. I don't know. But I've had them lying around for absolute ages, use them all the time. As far as I'm concerned, they're probably good enough for anything that I would ever need to do. They may not have all the features of Photoshop, but there's Photoshop rivals. There's, they've got a product called Designer, Photo, Publisher, and then they've got a bunch of add-ons as well. And it's 50% off, so you know, uh, maybe go and have a look, see if that's for you. I can highly recommend it. And also WP Social Ninja, they uh, are about to put their prices up. So I'm just letting you know that if you fancy securing that on a deal, so you're not you're not getting a deal as such, you're just getting the old pricing, which is going to go up uh, in the near future, but I don't know when, but it's uh, you know, worth mentioning. All right, we had WP drama. Now let's just do wider internet drama. This is naughty. This is quite naughty. I've been using DuckDuckGo. I got rid of Google on almost all the things about, I don't know, six months ago, something like that. And I decided that DuckDuckGo would be my search engine of choice for a little while. I've now moved on. I'm now using one called Kagi, K-A-G-I, 
which if Dan maybe is to be believed, is actually created by the guy who founded Manage WP. But I don't know if that's true. Kagi's kind of cool because their whole premise is as soon as they come out of beta, you're going to have to pay. So it'll be like 100 bucks a year or something like that. But they promise not to track you. And another company who promises not to track you is DuckDuckGo. But it turns out that they've been allowing Microsoft trackers. They have an agreement with Microsoft. Now, got to be clear, apparently their search product is clear. They're not tracking you if you search for things on their search engine web page. If you're using a browser, no. This is their um, this is their sort of search engine app that they've got. You can install an app on mobile platforms. There it is. You can see it on the screen. And if you go to certain properties, Microsoft trackers will be able to target you. Now, this is a bit of a PR disaster, I feel. If you're a privacy-focused company who basically say literally we don't track you, and then it turns out that they track you. Uh, what do you, what do you do? The CEO kind of got into the in, into it and basically fessed up right away and said, "Yep, we're doing it. Yep, yep, yeah, that's what we're doing." Uh, sorry, um, but to me, it feels a bit a bit naughty, uh, and I love it here. Search engine. Journal. Journal summarizes it as such. In short, the company that promises not to track you ever is actually tracking you sometimes. <laughs> I'll leave it. I'm just going to drop that. Mic drop up to you. What do you make of stuff like this? This just seems like such a ridiculous play on their part. I agree. If this is your like USB, why do you like how does this even make sense? And it seems like there was like a proper negotiation and a deal that was struck around this. It's not just something that uh, was just like overlooked. Um so that's that really is um a you know, sneaky and sleazy, I, I feel, you know, it's like, why, you know, you add one thing, you're the privacy browser. That's right, yeah. you had one thing. <laughs> but also, it's the fact that they got caught because somebody, you know how it is, it's the internet, somebody's gonna find out. So it was literally somebody, and I, I guess they got, they called them out on social media or something like that. They captured the data because that's what people do. They go around and, you know, they living in their bedrooms, just capturing data and seeing, oh, I wonder, and they caught them at it. And so, okay, I, I would get it if they actually came out and said like two months ago, do you know what? We've signed this great agreement with Microsoft. It's enabling us, because they're paying us tons of cash, it's enabling us to do all of these great things on the search engine side. But they didn't. They just decided to shut up and say nothing. That's the bit that stings. And I feel, actually, this is enough reputational damage for me to stop using them altogether. Software is so much about trust. Well, business is so much about trust. And this breaks the trust, right? because this is their this was their one thing this was the thing that they told their customers that they were going to do and that they were going to honor and they broke trust and that is extremely hard to recover from mm. yeah yeah um so i should probably just stay with kargi or go back to google and you know at least with google you know where you're at they're just going to sell everything to everybody and track every single thing that you do kind of free in that way you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I just gave up yeah. i check this out for how how much google track you I mean, it's not much of a thing but to me it's a thing i went into google maps the other day uh, because i don't know if you know on the phone you can actually download maps so you can go in and you can sort of say okay i want to get all of the uk or a bit of the uk and you click a button and it downloads it the, the bit that I found a bit weird is despite the fact that I'm going out of my way not to let Google have anything, there it was. It said, suggested map. Why don't you download Porto? It's like, no, how? How did you <laughs> even know? What was it? What, did, what was the thing that I gave away? Um, and so I clicked, yes, I'll download Porto because that's why I'm here in the first place. You know, and Google's argument would be, well, that was helpful, right? And yes, it was helpful, but it annoys me that it was helpful. And it annoys me that you knew that you were going to do something helpful. <laughs> you shouldn't have known. You know, like a good assistant uh, it predicts yeah. what you want, yeah. you know? Like it's, it doesn't, you don't, you don't need to even ask. It's just yeah. like it anticipates. I know, but I didn't want to be told. Do you want to download the yeah, anyway? There you go. So doc doc gone says Andrew Palmer. Yeah, nice. I, I um, see. 
I don't know if I'm so surprised uh, by this article, just fundamentally how DuckDuckGo works, and I could be completely wrong, uh, but isn't it just a curated wrapper of Bing? Well, my understanding is it's an... It's, no, my understanding is it calls through the Google API. I think it's the Google search, but just pushed through a different interface. So both you and I probably need to do figure out wh which one of us is telling the I, truth. I, I have looked into it a little bit. And yeah. it is you do get the Bing link uh, in your search results. Okay. So my, It'll be Bing my then, understanding maybe. is like... They're, they're like a curator of information using some other data broker, which is Microsoft. They're getting the data and they're just not sharing it, but turns out they are. But it's like, they are, but where'd you get the data from anyway? Yeah. Probably Microsoft, so I could have probably just assumed that you were going to give them a little something. Try this Kagi thing, K-A-G-I dot com. Give it a go. For me, it's worked perfectly. It, it, they don't have all of the whiz-bang stuff. You know, there aren't the extensions so that it automatically does things. You have to go into a setting in your browser of choice and set it up so that it will become the default search. But it seems mm -hmm. to work. And I do like the promise that if I pay, they will keep their hands off everything in the future. Of course, yeah. you know, two years from now, we'll, uh, we'll be having the same story. But Kagi sells the... Anyway, let's, let's hope not. Right, last piece for today... I, I don't I don't even know what to make of this story. Um, this is this is about Facebook or social media search engine journal again. California now, forgive me, I know nothing about American law. So whether or not this is ever going to become law, whether or not it's just going to sort of, you know somebody suggested it might be a good idea, but apparently, so the story says, California bill allows parents to sue for child social media addiction. In other words. If you can basically prove that your child is exhibiting signs of addiction, um, and it does go into what that means, I don't really understand what that, the technical terminology is, so I'm just going to read it out, and I quote, the bill defines addiction as a preoccupation or, obsessive with, or obsession with or withdrawal or difficulty to cease or reduce use of a social media platform, despite the user's desires to cease or reduce that use, which causes or contributes to mental, physical, emotional, developmental, or material harms to other users. So that was easy to say, wasn't it? There's, you know, um, you are going to be able to go out and sue the social networks. I, I don't know what to make about this. Part of me says, hooray! This seems like a really, especially when it comes to children. The other part of me goes, oh, I don't, I don't know... I would imagine that that would be very hard to do. But it's curious that we've got to the point where, you know, people are saying, look, this is fully an addiction, an actual addiction, and we need to tackle the people who are causing this addictive thing to to exist. So, again, I'll drop the mic and throw it out there. Maybe you totally disagree, think this is stupid. Maybe it's the most sensible thing you've ever heard. Don't know. I have some thoughts around this. Um, first of all, when it comes to the the addiction part of it, it's designed to be addictive. It's uh, there's like a, there's UX studies. There's there's uh, there's real intention to make you stay inside the platform, which is let their their objective, right? That's that's the whole point um, from a business point of view. So they they did it. <laughs> they they got it uh, working yeah. as expected. Um, now, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be in any kind of like disrespect or anything, but it sounds so American, you know, it's such an American thing to do. Uh, it's Californian. But, As a former Californian, uh, I lived there for nine years. It's, it's, <laughs> this is how things roll in Cal. But, you know, when I was a little kid, I remember people talking about how television was addictive for children and you shouldn't be sitting in front of the, or don't sit too close to the TV. And so now it's, now it's just the phone, it's right? Moral it's moral panic, right? <laughs> moral panic. Yeah. And then yeah. why are we blaming these companies? I mean, social media, yes, it's, I totally agree with what Vito said. It is designed to be addictive. They want you on the platform as much as possible because they want eyeballs for their ads, right? It, television, you know, in the day back, when you know you weren't supposed to sit in front of it for too long designed to be addictive and to get your eyeballs on it for as long but media itself is 
this is just an endemic thing within media. You know, news is incendiary um, and trying to get you worried and fearful so that you're watching CNN more. There's all sorts of media mm. associations that are trying to get more eyeballs, trying to get more clicks. Try there, There's all of these things that are the problem. But when do you give up being a parent and teaching your child that this is a thing and start blaming a company. That's what and I this mean. is where I shake my fist at California after living there was like, why are there so many rules? And, and it's, the, it's the parent's responsibility to teach the child because this is part of our reality now. This is not something that you can like the state's going to protect you from. Although I will say that legislators that try to do these types of things in order to push the envelope, in order to like open things up and make things more um, visible you know, things that are done in secret, you know, you yeah. can't really change. Yeah. Um, I, California just likes to be, they like to do this. <laughs> they like to really push that envelope and get things out there. Um, and it, an actual application of law it doesn't really make much sense. But I, I do think this is a good talking point for parents, especially us who understand what's happening with the media, to get the word out that this is a problem, um, but it is up to parents to teach kids to use social media, television, CNN <laughs> responsibly, and to be more discerning with their media usage. I um I ch I share a lot of what you said there. I guess I guess the piece of the puzzle which for me is a bit different from the telly is the is the fact that it's just there, right? It's just it's literally on your hand you know and we've got talks about all sorts of wearables that you know at some point maybe in combined with glasses and so it's not even you know you haven't even got the friction of taking it out of a pocket it's just there all the time and yeah. and the the sort of the way that it interrupts your attention span um and a little bing which is innocuous you know it doesn't well, it's a bing who cares but it can knock half an hour out of your day because suddenly you read that incendiary thing that gets you angry and sends you off reading news articles and it, and, and i think i think for i think the other piece is is that it's designed by incredibly intelligent people who uh, as vito said it, it's the point the point is to make it as engaging as possible and i think they've really succeeded and they've managed to turn all the dials up to 11 of of making you want to come back and but also sort of distorting all sorts of realities you know that beautiful is this that normal is this that successful is this and that's the bit that troubles me is that i, I social media came along at a time where i'd already learned how to be cynical and i think that children who are handed a phone at the age of whatever, six, eight, right. ten, whatever that might be. They haven't yet developed that ability to be cynical and they haven't developed that prism to be critical and have a sort of slight editor in their head going, no, that probably isn't true, is it? And and they're just, they're, they are just, it's a fire hose just shoving stuff at them all the time. Anyway, that's my piece. Sorry, Daniel. Oh, I have a, I think that this is a very important issue and uh, not to get like a little dark, but um, look at the data. I'm not going to like say my opinion on it, but just look at the data. Um, and I, this is like a guess too, but I would guess that, um, the amount of kids that hurt themselves per year is more than when social media, you know, did not exist. Um, I think that the rate at which things like have affect kids have effect on kids and their mental health is dramatically more dangerous now because they have access to that fire hose. So it's like, this can be a very serious thing if you kind of leave it unattended. Like kids are kids, let them be kids. If they got their own network and they got you know access to all their friends and it's all that content, great. Like, but don't give them access to the world. You know, they're not ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a reason why there's age limits on you know driving. There's a reason not not just because they're small. You know, your brain is underdeveloped, and like you know we we've learned a lot you know, as humans about neuroplasticity and like how your brain develops over time and it grows until you're basically either you get a brain disease or you die so you know think of how much growth your brain goes through from day one to you know, day zero like it's it's uh you know it's too much i think it's too much of a burden to ask the kid to use it responsibly i think you need to help them i think you need to kind of show them and support them and like use it in a way that add something else to their life. 
like social media should be mm-hmm. a, the sugar on top of the soccer game that you went to. And like, you know, nine of the 10 hours that you spent with your friends that day, you were engaged and maybe you spent 30 minutes uploading some photos to social media so that they could get them or like your family and you know, abroad to get them. Like, I think we've come so far from what social media is like, it really can be so damaging in so many ways. So I think it is very serious. I don't know California's take on it. You're right. California's kind of goofy with like, they're so extreme. It's like wild. Like, I don't want to know about all the California rules on every item that I buy because uh, they're always printed on everything. So I think that they have an interesting, you know, they're taking it seriously. And that, I appreciate that. But I don't know the way to fix it. And I know that it is a serious problem. I think that the curious thing for me is that the, the is when Facebook, I mean, particularly Facebook, I think is just the, it's the biggest target. So it's the easiest one to mention is when, when the, the feed became algorithmic as opposed to it being sort of timeline based, because you, we all remember Facebook in the day, it was just a litany of here's my meal. Um, here's my yeah. cat, but they were all people that you knew, right? They were people whose names literally collided with you yeah. in the real world all the time. And then the algorithm came in and it turns out that the algorithm is tweaked to, um, to, to, to push more engagement. That's the job of the algorithm. And the more engagement dial that they tweak just so happens to put incendiary stuff in because that is what gets more engagement. And given it's abusive the choice, by design. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> given the choice of sort of going down, let's do the algorithm for delight to make everybody's lives much more delightful, or mm-hmm. let's do the algorithm for profit. Well, they're a business, right? Let's we'll just yeah. we'll do the profit one because it just gets us more money. Um, and I think that's the bit is that the algorithm is you just such a, a mystery. You had like a, a channel about um, like the nice thing of the day or right yeah, like a yeah. Facebook, right didn't take off oh i mean it did during <laughs> no. the pandemic and then we just me and michelle just got fed up doing it so <laughs> we stopped doing it no but i mean like people like to see this stuff you know oh like, you're right yeah. but, 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 but here's the thing which i, mean, I think negativity, is that negativity you, what sells yeah. platforms you know yeah yeah i know what you mean but it's the same reason for example that we have uh, i guess in the uk we have guidelines about what content can and cannot be put on the telly right. because it's just deemed under law that certain things are, you know, you, there's a watershed. You can't show a certain type of content before nine o'clock because probably that's not suitable. And th- this whole debate, I think, has yet to happen. We have to figure out what these algorithms are doing. And I, I do feel a bit I do feel a bit unsettled when I see a bus stop full of children and not one of them is talking to their neighbor. They're all talking to, I mean, literally, they might be talking to the person They're three down, other, but yeah. <laughs> through the screen. Right? It's kind of weird. We all yeah. need to go out and put sticklebacks in jam jars more <laughs> and jump off bridges into rivers and things like that. That's, that's, that's my that's solution. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, right, that's it. We didn't solve that, but it was fascinating doing it. Um, I realized that we've run out of time, so I'm going to sort of kill, kill it there. Um, just to say, firstly... I'll see you soon, Vito. I will see you soon, Daniel. Thanks both of you for coming on the show. Kathy, unfortunately, we won't be seeing you this time around, but I really, really, really hope that I I managed to get one of those 650 tickets for WordCamp US if I can manage it and come and see you then. Daniel, this is new to you, but it's the slightly humiliating wave that we all do at this point. Would you mind waving your hands? (laughs) Vito and Kathy, can we all do it? I know, it's very humiliating. That'll do. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you that came into the comments today. Believe it or not, we will be back next week, despite the fact that we'll you know, be quite tired from WordCamp Mm -hmm. Europe, but new guests next week. Take it easy. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.